Hey, hey, friends, and welcome back to the Fierce Authenticity Podcast. And (sighs) big regulating deep breath today as I begin. As you may have noticed, there are no fancy jingles, there's no fancy introduction. None of those bells and whistles in today's episode. And I'm even calling it something different. The episode wants to be called an interlude. And that word came to me when I was reflecting on the guidance I had been given to turn on the microphone, sit in front of it, and share my heart and soul with you. It's been about five weeks, um, the entire month of February, uh, took off. Our last episode was the January 26th of 2023, and it was a beautiful episode um, on legacies with guest Raisa Monique. And, you know, it's interesting. What's coming to me as I say that is... A lot of what's been transpiring over here behind the scenes in the last four or five weeks since you've heard from me has been related to legacy. My legacy, what legacy I am leaving in the world, what legacy is my business here for, and so I just want to share with you where I'm at. Uh, It's really interesting because I had told my team that we're taking, like the podcast is on pause. And that never fully felt right to me. Something was off about that. And, And then today, the message came to me that I need to just turn on the microphone turn on the recording software, uh, share this message, share what's on my heart with you, and then let you (laughs) take it from there, really. And these are episodes There's actually a series of interludes that are coming in and that are coming through. And um, this word came to me in the shower as I was contemplating the idea um, that the podcast wants me (laughs) to literally just turn on the mic, no bells and whistles, no editing, completely raw and uncut like I used to do way back when this podcast first started. If you go back to the very beginning, I think about our first eight full episodes and the love notes associated with that. So almost, what's that? Eight times two is 16. Almost our first 16 episodes. Wait, is that true? Or is it just the first eight episodes? I'm not recalling 100% right now. And the point is, when this podcast first started, When I first got the message, um, boom, it's time to go. It's time to do this. It's time to turn on the software and open your mouth and let the divine channel through you. Um, There were no fancy bells and whistles. There was no music. There was no editor. There was no team supporting me in writing the show notes. It was literally me my microphone, my computer. And at that time, I did have a software that supported me in being able to ed- like do some really light editing in terms of like cutting out the ums and ahs and ands, shortening a little bit the gaps. And, you know, that was almost three years ago at this point. It was over two and a half years ago. And I've gotten really quite experienced in speaking between then and now and sharing the messages that want to flow through me and listening to the intuitive guidance that's coming through in terms of what to share with you. And so there's a lot less ums and ahs and ands and blank spaces to edit out these days. 
And so legit, what you are hearing right now, unedited, unscripted, literally back to basics, me, you, the microphone, the recording software, and this time, it's not even going to get the editing software. Literally, this episode, I won't even listen to it (laughs) before I post it. It's literally going to, as soon as this file downloads, it is going to upload into Apple Podcasts and be out in the world. Because that is what is being asked of me right now. (sighs) Another big regulating breath as I take a pause and check in and tune in with myself and see where we're about to head with this and and it feels really important to share the backstory with you so as you know um if you've been me with me for a while you know that i recently retired as a psychotherapist december of 2020 i finally decided to close up shop with my psychotherapy practice and pursue that which has been calling to me for years and years and years. Every time I close my eyes, it's what I see. Every time I tune into like, okay, what is the thing? It is always speaking, teaching, leading, facilitating. Every single time, facilitating workshops, facilitating retreats, facilitating the deep, deep, deep healing with the medicine that flows through me. And so I finally decided to stop denying myself that that is what my heart and soul were truly longing of me and to do it. And so last year, Memorial Day weekend, I was like, I can't do this anymore. I'm done. And because I am an ethical person (laughs) and value that part of me, I decided, okay, I need to give my clients and myself the proper amount of time to transition. And so, um, you know, it was Memorial Day weekend. It was the end of May. I decided I would tell my clients in June and that the practice would close out in December. And if you've heard other episodes, you've heard this part of the story and it feels really important to emphasize again because it all works together, trust me. (laughs) And so yeah, I finally said no more. I can't keep lying to myself. I can't keep denying the desires and the dreams that have been placed upon my heart. I can no longer ignore and deny this. I can no longer half-ass this. I can no longer just dabble in it and um, made the decision. Done. And of course, those six months between uh, May, you know, the end of May, beginning of June and the close of my practice really was a huge, huge, huge identity shift for me. It was really like, oh my God, this has been my identity for the last 18 to 20 years. Um, and on the psychotherapy track for 16 of those 18 to 20 years. And it was like, holy fuck, well then who the hell am I? If not this, You know, and I know that there's someone listening to this for whom you understand what that means, that there's something in your life and you're like, oh my God, but who would I be without this identity? Who would I be without this thing that I've done for my whole fucking life (laughs) or my whole adult life, my whole career? And like, it was such a deep, deep, deep process of you know, really going in and sitting with myself. And I can't recall if I shared this on the podcast or not, but um, a colleague and friend, Tatiana, um, she's a fellow social worker, and she had posted on Instagram something about radical social work. And I'm spiraling, I'm spinning, and I'm having this identity crisis. And 
I see this post of hers and it says, you know, most social work like tries to help change like the individuals, like working on a micro level, right? And radical social work is about like changing the macro level systems that create the problems on the micro level anyway. Whew. Yeah. And when I read that, I was like, oh, right. Yeah. Done. <laughs> done. Like identity crisis fucking done. Because I was no, just because I was no longer going to be a therapist did not mean that I was leaving my roots as a social worker. And I don't think I've shared about that enough here on the podcast. My background and training is as a social worker. Um, my undergrad, I have a double bachelor's, of course I do, a double major in psychology and Spanish. And I ended up in psychology as a major because it was the only class in high school that was interesting and like stretched me and challenged me in all the right ways um, in high school. And so when I went to college, I was like, uh, I don't know, I have to declare a fucking major. I don't know what the hell that means. Like I'm the first in my family to go to college, uh, a four year university education. Um, my parents both went to trade school. And before that, you know, one of my grandmothers only has up to a third grade education had she has passed away, but she had only up to a third grade education. And that was in Fiji. And I'm here in America. So I'm like, I don't know what the fuck any of this means. Declare a major. Okay a course of study. Fine. <laughs> and then I declared psychology. And Spanish just so happened to be I was so far advanced because I think I took four years of Spanish in high school. And I was so far advanced because, of course, high achieving, go getting me. Um, I was so far advanced that my even though I started in like Spanish 102, the instructor's like, yeah, you don't belong here. You belong in at least like 201, maybe even 202. I'm like, okay, cool. So I'm a freshman uh, starting in like second year Spanish, which actually turned out to be really, really cool because I realized that if I also major in a foreign language, that will give me the opportunity to study abroad. Like it was a part of the requirements for the major. So I was like, and actually there's one more piece of that. And with the um, psychology major, they were like, yeah, it's not recommended that you um, study abroad your junior or senior year. Like they just discouraged it because like the coursework got more intense and, um, you know, with research and all this other stuff. And so I was like, oh, OK, like study abroad. And I'm already starting in second year, <laughs> which means by my sophomore year, I would be third year level. Uh, which means I could travel abroad and still like get my Spanish or still get my psychology, like still be here for my psychology major. And so that's what I did. I'm like, okay, cool. I guess we're a double major now. <laughs> and, and literally, um, that's what I did literally. So I went and studied abroad. Uh, I went to Mexico because, I'm here on the West Coast and it was like, yeah, going to Spain would be nice. Going to Ecuador would be nice. And the reality is I live on the West Coast in particular. You know, I'm from California. A lot of who I interface with comes from Mexico. And so even though it may have sounded like more boring and not as glamorous, that's where I went. I went to Mexico and I spent the second semester of my sophomore year there um, of college and then, so that's like the 20 years ago, right, that I started in the psychology profession. And then when I returned my junior year of college, I actually ended up somehow like qualifying for work study. And there was this work study fair. And I recall that our local, I went to school at Pacific University out in Forest Grove, Oregon, literally the middle of cornfields at that time. And, um, and it was Washington County. And there was this, this table at this job fair, this work study fair. And it was to do your work study at the Washington County Juvenile um, Justice Department, like the juvenile department. And I was like, that sounds really cool and really interesting. And so I applied. 
I got the job and I did much of my junior year, like my work study was with them. I was in the early intervention assessment unit at the most amazing uh, supervisor there. Shout out to Leroy Labonte. I'm not sure. I'm sorry, Leroy Labonte. I am not sure if he listens to these podcasts. And if you do, Leroy, just thank you so much for really mentoring me and guiding me. And um, wow, I'm tearing up. <laughs> And uh, believing in me, right? And that this like is something I was really good at. And so when my work study ended, my senior year, actually, um, there was an opening that had opened up. It was a full-time position. And Leroy said to me, you know, you should apply for it. And even if you don't get that position, like just throw your name in the hat anyway. And so I did. Interviewed, did the whole deal. And I didn't get that full-time position And what ended up happening is one of the panelists that was on the interview, um, Lori, she was there and she needed a part time person for drug court. Um, And she approached me and said, hey, uh, I was there (laughs) Uh, because I'm also kind of low key uh, screening for candidates. And we think you'd be a great candidate for the part time uh, drug court position, especially because you're finishing up your senior year, you know, there's still coursework and all that stuff. And so that was my junior and senior years, literally was working in juvenile justice. Um, And I fucking loved it. Like, literally, I served as a mentor to these youth. It was funny, my drug court days. um, And my drug court kids are actually uh, grown ass adults now with their own lives and their own careers. There was a gentleman named Frank, or he was a young man like uh, back then. And he has since reached out to me. He found me on Instagram and he says, Miss Sharani, guess what? I'm a probation officer now. And I was like, oh my God, like this is amazing. Like when he reached out and shared that with me um, a few years back, it was so miraculous so amazing and um and so the kids called me I was known as the pee lady so even though it was really fucking fun I was the pee lady because I went with my toolbox full of um urine kits to collect for drug court (laughs) to report back uh as their you know quasi probation officer type person I don't even remember what my formal title was but that's what I was doing And um, it was really fun and I enjoyed it and I loved it and it lit me up because it gave me an opportunity to mentor and be with and support and guide the youth who, you know, my belief is that kids are good (laughs) and that it's the adults in the systems that are fucked up. Um, And... And just to be able to support these youth, you know, and there were families because this was, I mean, it was a social work job before I was a social worker, right? And this was before um, I was even, you know, like I said, I'm still a senior in college. And they, most of the work I did, if I wasn't standing in court delivering a report to the judge, um then I was in the field. I was meeting kids at school. I was meeting them in the community. I was meeting them in their homes. I was meeting with their families. Like it was just so beautiful to make these connections and relationships and know that I'm making a positive change in the lives of these youth. Um, And that was 2006 before the economy crashed. And so every job I was applying to at that time was, you know, as I was coming upon graduation, it was master's required, master's preferred. And I had no intentions of going to grad school, none whatsoever. And I ended up actually, um, I got an email from FastWeb. I don't know if you remember FastWeb back in the day. I don't know if it still exists, but it literally like, had all this information from colleges and it would send you these emails like about colleges or financial aid or whatever. And back in the day, I had a Hotmail inbox and it was in my junk mail, this email that said, hey, 
NYU has extended their social work deadline. Now, mind you, I had no desires, no plans. It wasn't like I was like, I'm going to grad school. I was like, no, I really want to work with these youth. So I was interviewing for jobs. And at the same time, when that email came, I was like, you know what? I am going to go ahead and apply to that school. Remember, though, I had no plans. And so I had not taken a GRE or any of that shit. And in the uh, the email, it said, NYU has extended their social work deadline. And so I'm like, okay, cool. Let's see what this is about. No idea what the program is. No idea about any of that. And I'm like, oh, cool. I don't have to take the GRE. Awesome. Because I haven't taken it, nor do I plan on taking it. Done. Apply. Sent. The end. And I kept doing job interviews. And literally there was this job, uh, a similar type job, just working with youth and families in the community, mentorship, guidance, uh, all the things that I love, all of the things that I wish I had had um, and didn't have, you know, all of those things. And I loved it so much. And it was like, oh my gosh, this job is going to be the perfect fit. And it was in the low 30s. Like we're talking, and I'm not talking like $30 an hour. I'm talking like low 30s, like maybe it was $30,000 a year, $31,000 a year, $32,000 a year max. Um, And so I was like, ooh, or was it 28,000? It was really low. It was like around the 30s. Now, mind you, uh, going to private college, (laughs) going to private university, like each fucking year's tuition was like $30,000. So anyways, thank you, I really am grateful for Pacific University, and I have this joke. I'm like, yeah, they bought me with scholarships. And so I am so grateful for all of those who contributed to those scholarship funds and made it possible for me to go there, not for $30,000 a year. (laughs) Um, and, uh, And it was just amazing. And so I applied for this job, and literally I received my offer letter from the job. And my acceptance letter from NYU within 24 hours of each other. Like it may have been one night and the next morning or something like that, like literally. And so here I am at this crossroads. Take path A, the job, or take path B, grad school. And I grew up, I grew up in a South Asian immigrant family that highly, highly, highly values education, that truly believes that education is your way out of like any, anything. Um, And sidebar, that is true on some level. And it's your way out of anything under systems of supremacy and oppression. So sidebar. (laughs) And so I, because I grew up in a family that highly, highly, highly values education, I was like, okay, I guess I'm going to grad school. And I turned down that job and I said yes to the NYU School of Social Work. And so that was like six, more than 16 years ago now. Um, Gosh, how long has it been? I graduated in 2006 from undergrad. So it was 2006 when I started and we're in 2013 or 2023. Yeah, it was a long fucking time ago. (laughs) Um, Maybe going on 17 years ago. And and so I did NYU School of Social Work, like the master's program and had no fucking idea that it was a highly, highly, highly clinical school. Um, And by clinical, I mean, there was a lot of focus on the psychotherapeutic aspects rather than what I saw as like traditional social work. And I was angry for most of my time there because I'm like, really, these fucking bitches, like these little bastards, like I went to school, got my undergrad in psychology, did four years of this shit, and they're trying to jam it into like four semesters. What the fuck? So I was pissed as all get out. Like I was not a happy camper there. Um, there's only one person, Ralph DiPaolo, um, shout out to Mr. DiPaolo, who was my practicum professor. And he literally is like the only reason I had a good time at NYU, (laughs) like the only, um, 
person who offered and provided value there. Uh, and then, of course, my friends. Um, and uh, so I was like pissed the entire time. Didn't learn anything at school. I learned everything through my internships, which, by the way, was free unpaid labor, which, by the way, I also had to pay for because they were requirements. And so they were credits that I had to pay to NYU to work for free. So I was paying to work, by the way. Side note. And um, and how fucked up is that? I'm just going to drop that right there. So practicum, like my internships, that's where I did all of my learning. And in practicum is where we put it all together. And um, yeah, so it ended up being a really clinical program. And so what happens when you graduate from a clinical program, you kind of end up in clinical jobs. And so literally didn't even question it. Like, it's just what you're quote unquote supposed to do. It's the next step. It's the path you're supposed to follow, right? And so after that, every single job I had was a psychotherapy job. And like 95% of them, actually like literally all but two probably, uh, or maybe all but one of those jobs was bilingual Spanish speaking. So just a heads up, like I was not, you know, this Spanish major was not gone to waste or anything like gone to waste to listen to me speaking systems of supremacy. But anyways, it wasn't like all for naught. And um, so that's just what I did. One bilingual Spanish speaking, like, you know, therapist position to another, to another, to another, literally for 16 fucking years. And so when I saw, and and so I like my brain got so wrapped up into the identity of the social worker who's really the psychotherapist, like the clinical social worker who sits on the couch and does like the traditional psychotherapy stuff, which by the way, shout out to social work and social workers, because I think like we definitely have an edge (laughs) above others, which is that we are so active and we're so engaged with our clients and really like to me, it feels more like coaching than therapy anyway. And um, and my clients always loved working with me. They loved the results that they got with me because like I would have people come into me and be like, you're not just going to sit there and ask me how I feel about that, are you? And I'm like, fuck, no, that's boring as hell. <laughs> like, I don't want to do that shit. Um, and so like active, engaged and like that's what I did for 16 years. And so when I saw Tatiana's post about radical social work, I was like, oh, right. The only identity I am leaving behind is that of psychotherapist who works behind closed doors in these one-to-one settings. Um, And granted, I worked with couples and I had facilitated groups also, which I fucking love facilitating groups. Um, And like, but it's so private. It's so isolated. It's so one-to-one. You know, it's just like... Yeah. And I had forgotten that who I really am is a social worker and that social justice and equity and inclusion and belonging and creating a better world, like it's in my blood, it's in my DNA um, to do this, especially as someone who grew up in a violent, alcoholic, low income immigrant family system. Okay, and so it is literally in my blood to want to change this so that other people do not experience the same shit that I did. And if you've been with me for a while and if you've been listening to the podcast, then you know that a huge part of what this podcast is, is to illuminate the way systems of supremacy and oppression show up internalized within ourselves. And then we replay it and replicate it in all of our relationships with ourselves, with each other, with our um, partners, our spouses, our children, our bosses, and even with other like circumstances and achievements like that's just what we do (laughs) um and we replay it so like you know my whole thing was wait a minute like as I worked with um mentor and my mentor and healer Milagros Phillips who I had interviewed on the podcast she is season three episode one healing racism with Milagros Phillips please go listen to that episode it's so good Um, actually I think every episode of the podcast is so good and every guest episode is so good because I hand select all of my guests. P.S. Um, 
in so many ways. So that episode with um, Milagros, like working with Milagros, like and healing my own racialized trauma, like healing some of those ancestral wounds, healing some of that, like it really showed me my own internalized racism. It showed me my own internalized oppression. It showed me my own, like all of the things. And I started realizing, holy shit, all of this stuff, we can talk about changing external systems all we want. And if we do not change ourselves internally, nothing is going to work. And Milagros has this uh, quote that I'm just reminded of. She says, you know, you can't legislate people's hearts. Like we have to change our hearts in order for these systems to come undone. And you cannot legislate people's hearts. So legislating meaning all the systemic changes that people want to make, all of the external out there changes. Now, mind you, those changes need to be made. Those systems and structures need to come fucking falling down and collapsing like Humpty Dumpty when he fell off that fucking wall, which, by the way, we're in the process of right now, which is why it feels so shitty, <laughs> like that literally America is going through this reckoning where Humpty Dumpty is like falling off that fucking wall um and and like so those systems and structures do need to change um and by change i mean completely be smashed to smithereens completely demolished and then come back to um to rebuild and to rebuild anew to rebuild with hearts that have been changed from hearts that have healed, let go and healed their own internalized racism, their own internalized oppression, their own internalized supremacy, and thereby the interpersonal supremacy, oppression, um, racism, misogyny, all that good stuff, you know, <laughs> that, that we see in the world. And and the thing is, like, you can change those external structures all you want, but if you're not also changing the micro level, so you can change the macro level systems all you want. If you're not also doing the work on a micro level with the individuals, none of those system changes are going to stick. It's going to revolt. I mean, all of a sudden I say that and I'm seeing the January 6th um, shit show at the Capitol, right? With all these white supremacists, all these white folks who walked up in there um, and this insurrection as they're calling it. And <laughs> as, as someone who was born in Fiji, like, yeah, their attempted coup, their like failed attempted coup. <laughs> and so anyways, and so like that, that is what you see when systems change but the individuals do not. And that is why it is so important to me that we do this work, that we work on our own internalized supremacy, our own internalized oppression, our own systems and structures that we have internalized based on everything that society has told us, that culture has told us, that our families have told us, like all of that. And that is why it is so important for me to, like, that is what drives me to do the work that I do. And really, it's because I do not ever want to have children experience the type of traumas that I did. And as I started dismantling my own internalized racism and healing through that, and I started seeing like, wait a minute, all this time, I thought it was my family's fault that I grew up in this violent unsafe, like chaotic, confusing, um, alcoholic, low income, poor immigrant family system. Like I thought it was my family's fault. I thought it was their fault that, you know, I grew up believing that I sucked, that I'm not worth anything, um, that like there's something inherently wrong with me, like that, that I'm wrong, that I am wrong, right? Brene Brown teaches us that is the definition of shame. I am wrong. And so I thought it was their fault that I grew up in the situations that I did, that I experienced the experiences that I did, that I wasn't protected in the ways that I needed to be protected. And 
like really thought it was because of them and tried so fucking hard with my head to understand that like they really did the best they could. And I struggled so fucking hard and I still had that. But if they really loved me, they would have protected me. If they really loved me, they would have kept me safe. So I must not be lovable. I must not be worthy. I must not be valuable. I must not mean anything. I must not be um, worth anything. I must be unworthy of love. And so even though on a logical, like, yeah, yeah, they did the best they could, it literally wasn't until I could start to see that actually it wasn't my family's fault. It was because of the systems of supremacy and oppression that have been put in place, granted, This has existed. If you've been with me, I have a whole episode called 5,000 Years of Supremacy Culture or something like that. If you've been with me, then you know that systems of supremacy and oppression have existed since the first colonization, which to me occurred in ancient Sumer five or 6,000 years ago. And so supremacy and oppression have been with us since then. And here's the thing. White man systematized it, so it became systemic racism, institutional racism. It became systemic oppression. It became systemic. It became institutionalized. It became institutional. And that, that is what led to and caused my family to experience what they did. Um, I'm thinking of Milagros again. She has a quote that um, internalized oppression becomes depression. And my friend, how do we cope with depression when we have no other school, like skills and tools? We drink, we drug, we eat, we shop, we binge, we do Oh, we scroll, (laughs) Uh, we Netflix, like there's a lot that we do in order to cope with the systemic oppression and violence that, that we experience, that we live with, that occurs on a day to day basis. For all of us. And so when I could understand, when I was like, oh, shit, it really is not their fault. It really is the system's fault. That is when it finally dropped down into my body when I can fully, when I was able to fully embody that like, Not even that they did the best that they could, but literally that they could do no better. Literally that they were doing everything they could with what they had in the systems that they had, right? Back in Fiji, I mean, there is still to this day so much domestic violence that occurs. Um, And when you think about it, okay, so... Indians from India were taken um, to Fiji uh, to work the sugarcane plantations, right? When white man came, when the British came, and when the world decided, okay, yeah, uh, slavery is bad, we can't enslave people, um, they decided to turn it into an indentured servitude system. And so they made these promises of this beautiful life awaiting them in this faraway, uh, magical, tropical land. And then when you fucking got there, it was a royal shit show and absolutely nothing like they had promised. And there was still so much poverty, so much oppression. And the story in Fiji, as I know it, is that there was never an, an, an assimilation that occurred or an integration that occurred between indigenous Fijians 
and the um, Indians that had been taken over by the British. And that there was always this division and always this rift between them. And so like these, you know, poverty systems of oppression, divide and conquer, all of those things, <sighs> big breath, <laughs> all of those things. And that's just five generations. I mean, prior to that, they were in India and the British were in India. And I grew up Hindu and even Hinduism, the dogma associated with Hinduism is a very patriarchal and oppressive culture. Now, I say the dogma because guess what? There are a lot of powerful goddesses in the um, in Hinduism and some may be more powerful than the male deities, gods and deities, okay? And so when I talk about the dogma, it's that they bastardized the religion. They bastardized it all and bastardized the feminine and all that stuff, but that's for another day. <laughs> that is a podcast episode for another day. My point is that I come from a long legacy, long legacy of oppressed peoples. And I know that I am here to help shift that, to help break down and demolish these fucking systems that are in place. And not because I'm doing it like out there, but because I'm supporting people in how to do it in here, inside, within themselves, in their own hearts, in their own minds, in their own bodies. Because guess what, friends? Anything that you do not metabolize, like any emotions, any experiences, any trauma that you do not metabolize and move through gets stuck in your body. It alters your gene expression and your DNA. And then that DNA is passed down until someone finally turns around and says, no more. This stops here. And I am that person in my family leading the charge. Now, um, granted, there are others like my beloved sister who's doing her part in breaking these legacies and these curses. And as the eldest, I am that trailblazer. I am that legacy changer. I am that quote unquote pioneer. I always felt that. I was like, oh my God, I'm like a fucking pioneer in my family, really trying to find a new and different way of doing things. Because if you heard the the little brown girl episode that's in season one also, I talk about how I moved here when I was three. I immigrated to the U.S. at the age of three with my family, okay? And shit didn't fucking make sense. And so I always grew up feeling like an outsider, feeling othered, feeling like there was something inherently wrong with me. Again, because if there wasn't something wrong with me, uh, if I wasn't bad, if I was worthy, then people would have fucking protected me. <laughs> Not just the adults in my homes, also the adults at school, right? Like all of these systems fucking failed me. <sighs> and so a big part of the work that I do, these messages that I share with you are to support you like this podcast is to support you in changing your heart in breaking down in tearing down in demolishing these systems and structures and the ways that they operate in your brain in your body in your behavior in the way they operate in how you show up and how you interface with others with source and with yourself and it also is about changing those systems and structures from the inside out. And then there's the corporate part of my work, which is to actually go in. <laughs> 
I I'm calling myself a social worker disguised as a corporate consultant. <laughs> um, and so I'm still fucking social working. I'm still doing systems change and I am going to do it from the inside. If you've heard other episodes, then, you know, I talk about it as the Trojan horse approach, literally coming in and attacking the enemy from the inside. Um, and so literally like the corporate consulting work, I am still a social worker and I am still changing systems. And when I am in there consulting with these organizations, really, I'm changing the systems and the structures and I'm social working from the inside out. But but I'm making it look good. It's not social work. It's consulting. It's DEI. It's belonging. It's relational wellness. It's leadership development. It's all those things, right? And so that is what we're doing here. That is what I am doing. That is what I'm here to do and to share because I don't want children to experience the preventable, 100,000% preventable relational traumas that I have experienced, that perhaps you have experienced, that people that you know have experienced. And so that's what we're doing here, friends. That is what we are doing here. Every time I turn on this microphone, I sit down in front of this recorder. Every time I close my eyes and channel these messages for you, that is what we are doing here. We are taking it and just breaking down just a tiny bit more of that wall of the system of supremacy and oppression and intergenerational trauma and these generational legacies. And we're chiseling away at it just a little bit, just a little bit, just a little bit more until the whole fucking thing collapses. Because my friends, that is what I am here for. I am here to fucking destroy that ship from the inside out. And so, yes, I share these messages with you to help you see, to help you understand, to help you chisel away at it. And if you are a decision maker or a leader or even in anything that you do, when you take this work into your life, when you take what you hear from me in these podcasts, when you take them and you apply it to your self, your relationships with your spouse, your children, your parents, when you take it into the workplace with you, when you use it with your colleagues, your employees, your leaders, your managers, your coworkers, when you take it to the barista at Starbucks or Pete's or any craft coffee place, like that is what we are doing simply by being who we are and seeing that these are the systems and structures that we have internalized, that we have been operating under, that we have inadvertently been perpetuating, and that here are the steps that you can take. Here are the ways for you to change it. And the first way is you need to be aware of what the fuck is even happening. And so you need to be aware of that. What is even happening? And from there, you get the power of choice. You get to decide, am I going down the old path and upholding the status quo and systems of supremacy and oppression and internalized racism and misogyny and all that other shit? Or am I going to show up differently? Am I going to show up as an instrument of love? Am I going to show up as a regulated nervous system for others to co-regulate with me and my nervous system so that we can all go out there and be more peaceful and loving beings so that we can then go home to our families and our children and be loving and kind and nurturing and caring as opposed to absent, unavailable, numbed out, checked out, so preoccupied with our own shit and our own survival, so locked up in our own trauma responses. 
And so my friend, that is what we are doing here. And that is what I am doing here. (sighs) And if you want in on this, if you want to take this adventure of dismantling and demolishing these systems that live inside of you so that we can change the external world, then reach out to me. Send me a DM on Instagram or Facebook at Sharani M. Batak. I will include those links in the show notes. Um, reach out to me via my website. Reach out to me via LinkedIn if you want me to come into your organization and teach this. You know, not just teach this, but literally lead and facilitate your leaders through this. Reach out to me. Let me know. Let me support you. Because what I can tell you, friend, is that out there, it's really fucking brutal. And it can be really easy to forget. And you need someone in your corner, a mentor, a guide, someone to hold that light and support you as you are doing the fucking gut, gut wrenching and grueling work of the inner fucking process of dismantling and demolishing all of this shit so that together we can create the world that you want to see, the world that I want to see, a world that our children deserve to see. A world based in love and not based in fear. A world based on belonging and acceptance and not of othering and not of conquering and um, what's there's the other word. It starts with a D. Um, dominating. <laughs> That's not what we're here for. So as you listen to my story today, my message, my download, if there is anything that has moved in you, send me a message. I want to dialogue with you. I want to be in a conversation with you. I want to be in community with you. Let me know what was shifted for you. Let me know what you got out of this. And take those next steps. Reach out to me for support, that individual one-to-one support or that small group support or that senior leadership team level support. And if you're not ready for that quite yet, no problem. Keep tuning into the podcast. Keep tuning into these episodes. Um, As I'm wrapping up today's episode, I am getting the the message, the hit, I'm getting the hit that we're going to have a lot more of these episodes. I'm calling them interludes for now, but (laughs) we might be on to a whole new season, friends. So keep listening to the podcast, rate, review, screenshot, tag me, let me know what you got. Sign up to get my emails where I share with you even more step-by-step of how the fuck to do this. And with that, I see you. I love you. And you're doing great. I see you over there doing all of the legacy shifting, change making, badass generational curse breaking fucking work. I see you over there doing that. And I love you. And you are doing great. (sighs) And with that, my friend, I will catch you in the next episode, whenever that might be. Um, And to stay in regular contact and communication with me, like I said, sign up to get my newsletter, follow me on socials. I put out content, messages out there daily. That's where I do my daily stuff. Um, And the podcast will be back when the podcast is back. 
So with my whole entire heart, I thank you so much for joining me for this episode, (laughs) interlude one, and we will be together again soon. Take really good care, my friend. And may you be happy, may you be healthy, may you be blessed, may you be well. Take good care.